Yes, welcome back to the Magic Sponge Podcast, Miracle Cure for all your rugby league injury issues. I'm Brian. I'm the guy behind NRL Physio, all the stuff you see on socials. James, mate, you nearly almost didn't make it. Last week was your flu game. I think this week is your like super dad game because uh, the rest of the house has gone down, mate. But you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out this afternoon. You're in, you're here. Mate, you couldn't miss out on this opportunity to heave it on me. You've beaten me, the Bronx have beaten the Finns, and you've beaten me in Supercoach. You can't miss this opportunity. You're right, Brian. That was definitely the motivating factor to getting on the screen with you tonight um, and getting in your ears, everyone. So, yeah, big win by the Bronx on Friday night. Suncourt was bouncing. It was a good vibe, actually, at Suncourt with everyone there. It was always good to get the W and not on top of the ladder anymore, Brian. So live it up while you could on the, on top there, but... It'd be better days ahead for the Finns, although there's a few injuries starting to mount there, isn't it? It's sort of troubling times for the for the boys from the peninsula. Yeah, mate, I haven't um, haven't broken it to Belle yet to tell her to change the magnetic ladder on the on the fridge. I think she'll be a bit sad having to move the Finns off the top, but I'll have to do it probably tomorrow morning, maybe. But yeah, the Finns are not in a good way, mate. I think. Um, I said uh, on Twitter they're, they're missing four of their best five players with the fifth um, in that group being Val Tafare, obviously. So at least they've still got that one gun player to, um, yeah, to live off. But, yeah, it's tough. It's tough times. I don't – I think we sat here in the preseason and we sort of said, you know, the, the one thing – the Finns could go all right. Just they they just can't have injuries because the depth just isn't there. And depth's a little bit better this year. But yeah, I think losing yeah. those four big Brian, guys. Brian, I um I missed a huge opportunity on my walk home after Suncorp. So we sort of just stopped off and had a few social catch ups. And anyway, I was walking walking home to get back to the car. And I walked. I didn't even realize at the time, but I was walking with one of my mates directly past Tom Gilbert. And I missed a massive opportunity just to say, hey, Tom, how's the ACL going? <laughs> what's the update? <laughs> I should have just leaned in and just been like, oh, hey, Tom, what's going on? But missed opportunity there for the sponge. Could have got some good sauce. Mate, you almost got to ask him how are his lungs going after the old yeah. uh, pulmonary embolism. Jesus. I know. Like, I know. It would have been a good chat. It would have been a good nerd out chat. But anyway, I missed my chance. Uh, Didn't right. shoot my shot. That's all right, mate. We uh, we we stick, um, you know, we stick to the above board stuff here at the Sponge. Just no inside word, inside info. Uh, but yeah, guys, look. As you know, this is where you go for all injury stuff in the NRL. We cover the in-game stuff. We read the review the big injury news and rehab news from the week. And we loop it all back to recovery time of on-field performance and super coach and fantasy scoring, which is the big one. If you get value out of this, patreon.com slash NRL physio, that's where you go. Got heaps of stuff over there. Head over there. It's going great. Uh, big write-up on Kalen Ponga after last Thursday night. So we'll obviously touch on KP here tonight, but I've got heaps of, and probably the most valuable thing for anyone listening is like heaps of past examples of guys who've had hit pointers, uh, those kind of injuries and how they've performed sort of moving forward, how the goal kickers, have, have they retained the goal kicking, those kind of things. And yeah, just really in depth. I think it's over 700 words or something like that. So yeah, anything you need to know about KP, if you don't get enough tonight uh, or this today, whenever you're listening, uh, yeah, head on over to Patreon and you'll get it there. But otherwise, yeah, let's get into not too bad an injury wrap, hopefully, for round six. I don't know exactly what he's done. I would have thought it was an ankle, but I, I'm just guessing. He shouldn't be out for a long period of time. I mean, I'm, I'm no doctor. We have to wait for the scans, obviously, but that'd be more positive than, than negative. Round six, we're going to kick off with the HIAs as we normally do, Brian. So three big names here that we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail. So the first one's Atili Tupanua from the Roosters. Uh, Cameron Murray was also ruled out from the Bunnies and Jack Bird. I think of note there, Cam Murray has the bye next week. So if he gets through with the 11-day sort of stand-down period there, then he should be all right the week following, hopefully. Um, but do you want to touch on Satili Tupanu in a bit more detail here, Brian? He's probably one of the more interesting of the three there. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, like I posted at the time, he sort of had four in the last four seasons, I believe it was from my memory of my own tweet, but I did look it up to double check. And I just, yeah, obviously um, a more extensive uh, history of concussion, a little bit more conservative uh, there we often see. But someone commented, and I think it's a, a point worth making or, or, or we're shining a light on, is someone said, man, the Roosters really seem to have a lot of players with 
um, you know, multiple concussion histories. And I do the injury profiles every year and I'll admit sitting down and then look, there might be players at other clubs who've had more concussions sort of behind the scenes that we don't know about. But yeah, the Roosters have got a lot, like even Egan and Nat Butcher have like multiple concussions in their history. Uh, you've obviously got Kiri. Uh, Tedesco, some big ones as well. There's there's a few others I, I can't think of off the top of my head, but I certainly remember sitting down and that Tupanua, the Butcher brothers, uh, Teddy and Kiri, and like Sam Walker as well. Now I think that Lindsay his Collins second. is another name. Oh uh, yeah, yep, a few Lindsay there for Collins. a bit. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely a few there, and 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 more than other clubs for, like noticeably from when I was sitting down and doing, because the injury profiles are a bit more condensed this year, but certainly last year and the year before, I did four, oh, probably 14 to 16 players at each club and tracked their you know whole recent injury history. And yeah, I certainly noticed the the roosters. So, the, the, you know, I mean, a lot of concussions are just one of those things. You cop a bad, bad hit, but yeah, it's just uh, an interesting, interesting thing, thing to note, I think. Yeah, very good. We'll move on to the first game of the round there, Brian, in a bit more detail. So Knights Roosters, the big one out of this was Kalen Ponga. Joey Johns was in the commentary box having conniptions when he saw Kalen Ponga grab at the hip. A lot of um, panic setting in there for the Knights supporters, obviously. What we sort of have heard after the game, Brian, was hip pointer was the diagnosis there for Kalen Ponga. Have you heard any more detail additionally to that? Mate, between what Joey Johns was carrying on about and then I think we had Mick Ennis over on Fox calling it a hip pointer, uh, sorry, a hip flexor, and everyone's messaging me, what's a hip flexor? I've never heard of that before. And I'm going, I don't think he's done his hip flexor. It doesn't look like a hip flexor. And, uh, yeah, it was just a – yeah, it was an interesting situation. So, yeah, hip pointer, the simplest way to describe a hip pointer is a really, really, really – bad cork to the hip so your hip bone uh sort of you know where you can touch and you feel that hard bone on your hip effectively there's a layer of muscle in between that bone and obviously your skin when you land or you cop a blow to the hip in that area it just squashes that muscle into that bone and kind of yeah, pinches it really, really significantly. And it's just an area where you can get quite a bit of bleeding. Uh, it's it's an area that you rely on for a lot of function too, particularly in a game like footy. So, you know, you want to run, you want to change direction, tackle, you know, tackling's in around that area as well. So, yeah, it's, it's an injury in footy that can be quite debilitating. It's not an injury that requires a lengthy recovery period. I think in my time tracking injuries over the last six or seven years in the NRL. I've only had a handful of guys require even a week off uh, from a hit pointer. Usually they'll play the next week. They're super, super painful in the in the following day, sort of when that bruising sets in. It, yeah, like Kalen would have been really, really limping around heavily if if sometimes, you know, players can't or athletes can't even walk in those coming days because it's that sore and that yeah sensitive but yeah he it, it usually more often than not and i would say like above 90 percent of the time guys are right to go in in seven to ten days and ponga does have that uh, extended turnaround because they played early in the week i think it was about a 10-day turnaround so i'm extremely confident he'll be right uh for next week yeah then I guess the question goes to performance. And as I said, I alluded and, and gave specifics uh, to players over on Patreon of like exactly how their scoring went. But in general, I would say that the scoring that isn't affected all that much. I think one of the, I, I guess, highest profile ones was Ruben Garrick in 2022. Uh, and he, he, he returned relatively well. He did have the buy in between. So came back that second week and performed. Yeah. Really well, really well moving forward. Now the, the, the main issue here is your, his level of tolerance for aggravation. So in other words, he can just get hurt 
easier because that hip is sensitive where usually he could cop a big blow to that hip and it not be an issue. Now it won't take much and that hip will aggravate again. So he's at risk that he might need to go off, get another injection, which is probably, I mean, it wasn't confirmed on the night, but that was probably what happened is he went in. I think someone said, you know, the magic hands of the physio, but I was like, oh yeah, the magic hands of a, of a local anesthetic, I think probably would have been the big thing. Uh, so yeah, like he's at risk of needing to go off and get that again is probably the biggest thing. Goal kicking, like if he's fit to play, he's fit to kick. I don't, I don't see that being a big issue. I mean, I'll throw to you as our super coach analyst expert. Uh, what are you doing with KP? Like I assume just carry on because he's killing it. I mean, he scored 90 points and he had half a leg yeah. for most of the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's play on in my book. Um, in terms of where he sits next week for the draw, I think Manly play the Titans. So my captaincy will be sitting on Tom Trebojevic probably at this point in time. And then the Knights play second last. So I think by that stage, you're going to have a reserve on him anyway. You can probably flick to a different player if you need to. They play the Bulldogs, so you might have to just flick it on to maybe one of your front rowers if you're really desperate or um, the last game of the round is obviously Sharks v Cowboys. So you might be able to find a, a way around that. But I think he's going to be in re your reserve slot anyway at fullback if you've got uh, Tommy Turbo because, let's face it, if he's playing the Titans, that's big time. That's just a bit of a no-brainer. Even if the Knights are playing the Bulldogs, the Bulldogs have shown a little bit of ticker though. I think the, Knight, uh, sorry, the Titans look like they're struggling a bit more. So that would be my lean. At this point, Brian, I don't think there'd be any cause for concern there with Kalen. He gets the extra, you know, more like a 10-day turnaround rather than a 7-day even. I mean, that's massive for hit pointers. Like, it can just take an extra 24, 48 hours and he should be, you know, hopefully significantly better. If they do need to before the game, they'll probably needle him pre-game as well. So he won't have to have that period before half time where he was not in such good place because after the half he looked pretty good i didn't think there was too many times where i thought oh geez he's really favoring that at this point he looked pretty much back to he nearly sort of won the game on his own at the end and there with the the breakaway just didn't have any support um running with him so i didn't think after his needle he looked too bad at all so that'd be my take on things brian there i reckon i'd be play on storm doggies was the next one only one injury here brian to become a kamitha with a calf injury have we heard severity on that calf injury? No, I haven't. I, like the one thing I'd say about this is whatever the severity, whether it's my, it's probably minor or moderate, it's not going to be a high grade calf strain, unlikely. But Kamika Mika, Kamika, Kamika Mitha has a history of calf issues. He's had two or three that I've tracked over the last couple of years. And one of them he had an extended recovery time for. So we know that's pretty typical for calf issues. Uh, but yeah, look, obviously any history in that same area, once you start suffering the injury again, it just means the recovery time is probably going to be that little bit longer. So the fact he went off after one hit up and he's also got that history, I think you're looking at a multi-week recovery. I'd be surprised if if he only misses a week, put it that way. I'm thinking more, you know, four to six is probably where my gut lands at this point in time. Might be a Nelson or Sofa Solomona inclusion there for those drafting, I would say, in the front row. So might be one to keep an eye on. Um, the Brisbane Brouhaha, Brian, from Friday night out of this game. Some big updates for the Dolphins there. So just in terms of my takeaways from the game, Brian, as well, it was interesting going to a game outside of Magic Round because I haven't been to the footy outside of Magic Round for a couple of years. There was actually women at a football game, which is not common <laughs> to see at Magic Round because it's truly blokes weekend and lads on tour. So I was shocked to see there was like a, a reasonably high proportion of women at the game. I was like doing a double take, just thinking I haven't seen people like this at a football game in a long time because I only do Magic Round, which is a very slanted Dad population. Schoolies, there, Dad Schoolies, mate. Dad Schoolies. It's yeah, marketed. it's Dad Schoolies. That's it's right. Yeah, that, it, and then it's taken it off. It really, really shook me. And I was just like, I was rattled. I was like, what the hell am I seeing here? Anyway. Onto the injuries from this game. So some big ones from the Finns. So Hamaso Taboy Fado was a hamstring injury. That's looking like great too, I think, by the sound of things. Uh, Cody Nicarim with a calf and Tom Flegler probably with a shoulder um, update there, Brian, because initially that was reported as a low-grade AC. It might be worth talking about Flegler a bit more because it sounds a little bit negative coming out of the Dolphins camp there about his prognosis, doesn't it? Yeah, I was just... Um... Oh, look, it, it was a bit surprising because they went minor AC. Then all, everything coming out of the fins during the week was their 
confident. Like, you know, it's a minor AC. He's going to be fine for next week, which you would usually expect with a minor AC. Like minor AC, they're going to needle up pretty well. They're going to strap up pretty well. You're usually going to see guys back the next week. I didn't even include him in the Patreon casualty ward on Tuesday night because I'm like, well, he's been named. They're all pretty confident. It's a minor AC joint. Not much to worry about in the grand scheme of things. I didn't really have much to give on that. Uh, but then I think it was the next day or the day after he was ruled out. And then Wayne's come out in the post-match presser, said, no, it's not getting better as quickly as we thought. Um, you know, not going to be right for next week. Just really, yeah, really, really concerning kind of – well, con- not concerning, like just really strange kind of stuff for a minor – AC joint issue. So I went back and found the mechanism because I hadn't seen it yet because I was at the game that that happened. So I like, I didn't see it and uh, yeah, just gave me a bit of concern for the actual ball and socket joint. So your AC joint is kind of more the, let's go this shoulder, the tip of your shoulder where your collarbone comes out and attaches into the tip of your shoulder or your shoulder blade. Whereas I guess the mechanism and the way that he injured it was tackling with his arm out away from his body and and someone has come and, and hit the top of the shoulder. That is usually, if you show me that, mechanism in isolation i think yeah like his ball and socket so his arm bone his his humerus going up into that socket of the shoulder joint and that's where you hear about like shoulder reconstructions you know cartilage tears those kind of things um so yeah like i just i'm a bit concerned that there might be something there he has had a previous shoulder reconstruction in the other shoulder um does he have some underlying things that make him more susceptible to cartilage tears in the shoulder that kind of thing it wouldn't be anything that would keep him out long term. Like it would, it would be something that at the moment, if it is AC and that's what it is, I'm expecting kind of two to four week return to play, um, as opposed to if there was shoulder joint involvement, more like a three to six week return to play. So it just pushes it out a little bit. But more, I guess, the concern would be if there is some shoulder joint problems uh then you you leave him his re-injury risk and risk for shoulder reconstruction is higher which i wouldn't worry about with an ac joint if he comes back from an ac i'm not really concerned at all so yeah as a guy as a physio who looks at these kind of things but also as a fins fan a little bit concerned about flegler i think i'll throw to you before i go on to hamaso and cody uh because they're relatively straightforward if you're a tom flegler owner i mean with that information from for me personally i think in the front row i'd probably be happy to sell and move on it, like I, in saying that, I'm someone who's got Max King in my front row, and I'm not selling him this week, even if he isn't named, because I've got other things that I want to deal with. But I mean, if you're sitting there, you don't have too many things that you do, like. Would you be pretty happy to sell Flegler at this point in time? Yeah, I would be happy to sell there, Brian. I think you've got a few sort of options you can go. That might seem a bit sideways, but I think you've got someone who's in better health, who's looking at bigger minutes and more guaranteed minutes in a solid role. I think that's the way I'd look there, to be honest. Front row forward, you're not going to probably shoot the lights out, but I think guys in that realm would be, especially like Stefano Utukamanu is probably the one. Isn't he? He's looking pretty, pretty, today. pretty, like. pretty handy. Um, Jamin Joloff is getting minutes at the Titans and scoring big, big points there. So he's an interesting one that when you look at his story, scoring historically, when he gets reasonable minutes, he he scores very, very well. And he seems like the front rower to own at the Titans, which really surprised me. And there's obviously a roll-up for grabs there with Tino missing. So a couple of sort of sideways-ish sort of options. Xavier Wilson's are down if he needs to open up some money as well. Xavier Wilson is not going to get big minutes to the Broncos, but he does have an attacking stat in him. So hopefully you can just ride the wave there and cash him out when he does peak in a little bit more value. So you could even go down and up if you needed to just generate a bit more cash there or open up some stuff to get on a more premium position than front row. That'd be the way I'd approach it, Brian. Yep, I like the I like it. I think, um, yeah, more than happy to jump off. Uh, Hamaso, yeah, look, moderate, four to six. Uh, it's in a good spot is how they released it. So you would assume like mid muscle belly, the difference there, a bad spot would be like tendon and not only tendon, but tendon, you know, either end, uh, whether it be at the, at the knee or up in the, uh, near the, near the pelvis there, but particularly up near the pelvis. So probably, you know, more muscle belly, a little bit lower where there's nice blood supply, good for healing. 
uh, yeah, that's what they say when they mean a good spot. Um, he apparently has a bit of a history of hamstring strains, although nothing that I've charted. So I just wonder whether that was like um, back when he's playing the lower grades for um, North Queensland potentially. As I think, or, or potentially like in off seasons and stuff like that, because he has had a PCL injury, which can leave you a bit more susceptible to hamstring strains as well. Uh, but yeah, look for someone with his speed. I mean, we spoke about with Jason Saab in the preseason, someone who relies on speed like him, they're not going to accelerate his return. Like it's going to be a minimum four weeks. They're not going to be bringing him back before that because yeah, for, for someone like that, you just can't, yeah, you can't take the risk because his game is just so heavily built on hitting that top end speed and you want him to be able to do that safely. So, uh, yeah, four to six weeks, he's definitely a trade out for me. And then Cody Nicarim with the calf. Yeah, look, like I I think Wayne sort of said they're pretty confident he might be right for next week. So if he's saying that, I wonder if it was a cork. I didn't see the mechanism necessarily. Haven't gone back uh, to look for that, unfortunately. But yeah, potentially he could be back next week. Just hopefully he's not our fullback is what I would say. That's a good point, Brian. The only other takeaway from that game is the attempted field goal by Jermaine Asako is the biggest oh. drop kick I've seen live. In my entire existence, that thing was shot out of a cannon. I cannot express enough how mind blowing that was seeing that live and in the flesh. But anyway, we'll move on and to I'm, the next. Well, game, not, which is I, I want to say yeah. Jermaine Asako too. Like in a yeah. horrible night for the Finns, you know, injuries no good, losing the game. That try, and you and I have a special affinity to throwing a pass to yourself. I was up and about for that. And yeah. when we were losing and, and, but I just love good footy and throw, yeah. Anytime you throw off a pass to yourself and it comes off all props to you. I love it. Yeah. I, I said to the person directly beside me, my mate, and I was like, I reckon if you put a Jermaine Asako best of highlights, it is better than nearly any other player in the comp at the moment. There's obviously been a cavern between his best and his not best, <laughs> but tell you what, on his day, if you put the best of the best, Jermaine Asako, the footwork is box office. Like, not not anything better. You, you could argue with me all you want, but I will just lean into Jermaine Asako being the best highlights real package that you could ever watch there. Warriors versus Manly was the next one, Brian. So this ended up in a draw. It's a good tight game of footy, actually. Two good teams in this game. Ben Trebojevic, hamstring strain, which we're going to talk about in a lot of depth there. That's an interesting one. Lockie Croker, which is reported as a shoulder injury. Um, Top Sipley was a knee. Hamali Olakawaja was a back. And Jazzy Tavanga was a hamstring strain. That looked pretty high grade, didn't it, Brian? Because he was getting assisted off the field there. Couldn't really put weight through his legs. So I'd, I'd be sort of banking that in as a high grade hemi. Where did you want to start there, Brian? Probably two interesting hamstring injuries there are probably the big ones that jump out, aren't they? Yeah, I completely agree with you on Jazz. I think oh, like, I was a bit surprised because, and once again, good example for anybody uh, listening, um, if you want to go back and watch, like the, the when he took the run that he suffered it on, it did seem all that bad and he got up and played the ball and then he's kind of, you know, motioned to the sideline and looked like he was coming off. And then, you know, flash forward 10 minutes or however long it was to half time, and here he is getting like chaired off or assist, like he's got his arms around two trainers and two physio, medical staff, whatever they were, to get off the field. And I was like, whoa, where did that come from? So it just shows you that, um, yeah, the, like muscle strains are hard to judge just from that video of the incident because, yeah, I would have gone, oh, yeah, minor hamstring strain and next minute he's being chaired off. And I totally agree with you. If you lose that much function, uh, you'd be thinking like kind of that six to eight week range. I think if he gets away with anything under that, you buy a lotto ticket because, yeah, that was – it didn't look good. Benny Trebojevic with the hamstring strain, yeah, I think um, – I, I don't know. I, like, I don't check the comments all that often, but I do. I try and check the comments when a player like a Ben Turbo, Joshy Schuster, you know, these kind of guys, or even Tommy Turbo, Kalen Ponga, who have those repeat um, injuries, because I find people can get a bit nasty at times. And, and so I want to kind of, you know, where I can try and, you know, clean out some but uh, the, the guys in uh i think it was instagram it was either instagram or facebook it was actually pretty funny someone said like it must run in the family and then there would be like 50 comments going hey it must run in the family hey do you think it runs in the oh family? i should just say that that was very good 
<laughs> and <laughs> I was like, going, must run in the family. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that, was, that was really, really good. So yeah, that, that gave me that that mostly, gave me mostly really garbage, good. but that was very yeah. good. And very that's good. like, I like especially comments on my things. There's, there's never usually that much entertaining, but that definitely gave me a little bit of a giggle. Uh, but there's something to it. We've spoken about it with Ben Drabovic on this show. So I think the general gist was people thought he only had two hamstring strains last year, but he, he effectively had three because he had two. And then on the second one, he re-tore it again at the end stage of rehab. So he's kind of got three hamstring injuries on that left hamstring, and then he's done the left hamstring again. So it's just like scar tissue on top of scar tissue on top of scar tissue. I mean, this was the risk, and we spoke about it with Ben Trebojevic going into the season. I thought at his price in Supercoach, he was well worth the you know the risk to for the upside, and I think that's – kind of paid off. He, he played really well for them. I thought he, you know, well and truly beat out Josh Schuster, although that wasn't saying much with what Josh is going through at the moment. Uh, but yeah, I think moving forward now with his price, I, like uh, there's, there's probably a few too many hammies there in quick succession for me with limited upside, particularly in classic. So I'd be looking to sell him on. I, I Like I'd, I'm expecting at least a, you know, two to three week recovery at best for this kind of thing and probably longer because they're going to have to do some, you know, even if it's a minor strain, he's probably going to require like a three to five week recovery period, even though it'd usually be two to four because they need to take a bit extra care with him and try and figure out what's going on a bit like they did with Tom. So yeah, I think he's just a sell. Like I, I, I don't think even if it comes out, even if it came out, it's the most minor of hamstring strains. I'm hoping to have him back in two weeks. I'd be happy to sell at this point because I just think the risk moving forward is probably getting to that place where it's a little bit too high for me. I'll just quickly go through the others. Lockie Croker with the shoulder slash HIA. I mean, he was taken off for HIA. They said it was his shoulder. That was actually a really good one to look at in terms of what I was talking about, about Tom Flegler. Uh, he had the arm out to the side, copped a blow on the top. Uh, he's got a, a really big history of shoulder issues, or Lockie Croker does. So I don't know whether they were just saying shoulder to like kind of take pressure off the HIA situation or whether he legitimately has a shoulder issue. So I kind of didn't, um, yeah, wasn't sure on that one. Toff Sipley with the knee, I couldn't find a mechanism and he came back on and played like most of the golden point. So I wasn't really sure once again, like what's going on there and Homale Olokowatu with the back. I mean, he played through it. It's probably just, you know, a bit of a back niggle that he's got to manage, but Ben Turbo, I'll throw to you. What are you doing? Are you going to sell or are you going to try and hold? Yeah, definitely sell. There's too many options at center wing and second row, isn't there? I think you just got to sell and move on. If you're drafting, Corey Waddell is probably not a bad pickup. If he gets 80 minutes on the left edge, it's always been a pretty attractive super coach spot for Manly. So I think that's the way I would lean. Eels versus Cowboys, Brian. So next game to discuss. Bailey Simonson was a knee injury. Jeremiah Nano was injured, but I didn't find any detail about this, Brian. I don't know if you can uncover any secrets or mysteries there about Jeremiah Nano. It's... um. Always a bit hush hush out of the Cowboys as well, isn't it? They seem to be fairly, fairly sort of specific with what they do and don't disclose to the media. Mate, I love the journos for so many different reasons. Obviously, they're the ones who get us, you know, the the rock solid info a lot of the time, especially the good ones. And um, I was really disappointed with the journos in the in the post match pressure after this because. There was just like in look, you know, I, I like I know I'm biased. I, I I like hearing about the injuries and and what's going on, so I can kind of you know talk through this kind of stuff. But not one question about um about the injured guys. And I yeah, I, like I would hope that that's a pretty standard question. Sort of moving forward is is just to kind of keep an eye on those kind of things. So yeah, there there was nothing obvious mechanism wise, and but he definitely seemed to be struggling. I went back to try and find the mechanism, and he was struggling really heavily. So like you know, maybe yeah, look, you'd just be guessing calf, hamstring, uh, you know, it, it could be so many different things when it's when it's not obvious. So yeah, that's why I haven't posted about it for those people who are in my DMs asking. Is that there's a no information out of North Queensland. B there wasn't anything obvious on the video, so I don't really have much to provide there. I don't even know if he's injured. To be perfectly honest, like I assume he is, but I don't know for sure. So that's probably the hardest thing there. Bailey Simonson with the knee. I think the interesting part here. Now I am going to 
postulate or guess here and say that uh, he was grabbing weirdly at like the outside of his knee and was strapped for the outside of his knee. So I just wonder, and I looked at the mechanism and he did, his knee got bent inwards as if like a kind of an MCL usually would be an MCL mechanism. I wonder if there's like a little lateral meniscus tear there because he did come back on lateral meniscus tear or even like in extreme circumstances like a lateral tibial plateau fracture because when your knee goes inwards, obviously the things on the inner side get stretched but the outer side get compressed. So, yeah, look, I'm not really sure there. He did come back on, which is obviously really good, but I just wonder whether he's got a little irritation of the of the knee joint surfaces on the outside there. But hopefully uh, the fact that he came back on means that he's going to be okay. But as we saw with someone like Jordan Rapana, not always a good thing because then he was out for six to eight weeks. Uh, yeah, it just reminded me of that situation a bit, I guess. Good update, Brian. So Bunny Sharks was next on the agenda here. So Ty Munro looks like a collarbone re-injury there, perhaps refracture. Tavita Totola with a foot injury and Jack Williams with a cork, I think is what I can see here. Ty Munro is the interesting one, isn't he? That's um, really bad news for the Bunnies. Yeah, mate. I I actually had a few Bunnies fans let me know that that's the if if he's fractured it, which it you know it's looking likely with his response and and kind of what happened there. That's the third time he's fractured his collarbone because he actually fractured it in uh, the preseason of last year as well. So he's fractured it in preseason this year. Apparently, just from like holding a tackle bag in preseason this year and just copped a blow and he's fractured it now. I guess the interesting thing to talk about here with collarbones is that they are a bone where, and and for any bone that is healing, you would have heard of calluses before, probably on your hands uh, where you get those like hard bits of skin. When a bone heals after a fracture, it gets a callus that forms around it, which is effectively just a whole bunch of new bone that forms around the area. And, and, And arguably it is stronger than beforehand because you get like this almost thicker bit of bone a lot of the time. Now the callus in a collarbone fracture, evidence says it it takes like four to six months to, to form completely. So it means that that collarbone kind of isn't back to, you know, stronger than it was before till, till around that four to six months. Now that's not to say that you need to stay away from sport for four to six months because most players will get back at around that eight week mark. And and this has been nine weeks for Ty Munro. And that's because look, everything looks good on x-ray. The actual fracture line itself is usually pretty healed by this point, but look, the collarbone is a tough bone to hide in a game like rugby league and especially in the NRL level. So obviously it wasn't, quite well you know it can just be bad luck but like obviously it just wasn't quite at a point where it could withstand the ins and outs of nrl football he's copped another blow to that area highly likely he's fractured again uh look it's a bit of a it's a bit of an interesting one because it wasn't reported whether he had surgery or not but surgery actually decreases the risk of refracture so without surgery the the Refracture risk. So if you go without surgery on a collarbone, and this is in professional athletes, I might say. So, so you know, in general pop, it might be a bit different. But in professional athletes, without surgery, the refracture risk is up around that, like twenty to twenty-five percent in some sports. So in some contact sports, so that's pretty high. In in after surgery, it's like below five percent. So surgery does obviously improve that refracture risk. But obviously, surgery comes with all the risks, infection. Like someone like uh, Sam Verrills had some complications, some bony healing issues after he had surgery on a collarbone fracture, had to have a bone graft, had to have a second surgery. So like surgery has its own whole thing it's it's a bit of a tricky area and you might talk to that a little bit more as to why in in the public setting they're quite hesitant to uh operate on that area but yeah it's going to be an interesting one if it's refractured it's going to be at least eight weeks they're not going to bring him back before that it might even be a little bit longer uh i'll quickly go to vita totola with the foot it potentially as a fracture if it is you know you're looking at at least six to eight weeks minimum and then leg cork for jack williams a leg cork is if it is a leg cork i didn't see the mechanism but if it's a true leg cork nothing much to worry about there he should be fine for next week at worst the week after but look mate ty munro munro with the collarbone walk us through as i said that they're pretty hesitant to do surgery in a particular in a public setting hey yeah very we don't often see them get fixated at least straight off the bat, you would 
probably be more common in the private, I guess, hospital setting. You'd probably see a few more get fixated that way. Publicly, they're fairly happy to manage people non-operatively, primarily to my understanding based on the reasons that a lot of them, even if they look pretty ugly on an x-ray, actually heal up and calcify really well and your functional impact's very minimal from that. The other thing is the type of fixation that you have for them is difficult because it's a interesting bone by design. It's not actually, it doesn't look like a flat straight line. When you look at it like an x-ray, you just think, oh yeah, this thing's like nice and flat and easy to pin and plate. It's actually not really that easy and and blood supply can be sort of compromised around there. A lot of, um, you know, structures in that area that you don't want to be mucking around with, with um, pin and plating as well. So they tend to lean to the non-op side of things quite significantly publicly anyway. So I guess privately, you probably see a few more get done. You probably see them get done in the younger population as well. But we do see a fairly decent amount of people that would go non-operatively. And if it's a non-functional, you know, ability to move the arm, then they may well get pin and plated then with bone graft too. So they're one that you can see multiple interventions on more so than a lot of other fractures brian i would say would you would you reckon that as well i think it's it's one that we do see quite a lot of repeat intervention on for for malunion or non-union i suppose you could say 100 percent in a in an athletic popula- population i think the big thing here is that you're often then going back to an activity that's putting at risk right like that that's probably the reason why even in that pro athlete kind of you know 20 to 25 percent that i'm talking about those people are then going back and every weekend they're putting themselves at risk whereas a lot of your people who and why non-operatively they're they're quite happy happy to do it in a public setting is that more often than not it's somebody who you know fell off the back of a truck you know or fell off their bike or whatever and so it's not something that they're doing week in, week out and putting their, you know, putting themselves at risk. Uh, but yeah, look, it's a, I, I think it's a great point you make about it being a bit of a contorted bone. I think that um, that definitely plays a role. But some of the rankest broken bones, like you, I've seen, you know, clavicles or collarbones come in almost like pitching a tent and they just, yeah, gone and seen a specialist going to manage it non-operatively they heal up really well they go back to sport and they've just got this bump in where their collarbone is i'm sure there's plenty of people listening who probably have it or have a friend who has it uh yeah so it's something that they don't tend to go off what it looks like a lot of the time and uh yeah and and usually it does heal up pretty well but unfortunately for time Munro, it hasn't been the case this time around yeah, it's a tricky one as well when you get um i guess the fracture uniting in that 10 position brian i can think of one person i had who his work role was climbing up power lines and his um like his vest that he had to wear went right over the top of that. So he had amazing function, um, but just because of the nature of where his work gear sat, it was really quite irritating for him because it was almost like an abrasive sort of frictiony sort of type thing as well. So it can go that way with people with collarbone injuries and collarbone fractures like that. But yeah, for Ty Munro, God, you hope he hope he gets it sorted. Uh, you know, with the bunny season the way it's going. And his age, you know, maybe they look to next season as well, depending on how it all shapes out. I'm sure they want him on the field to get results. But if you're staring in the barrel of bottom eight footy, you may be a little bit more cautious there with Ty Munro. Tigers Dragons was the next game, Brian. No injuries to report out of that one here tonight. Raiders Titans was the last game. Two big ones here for super coach purposes. So Zach Hosking shoulder dislocation and then Jaden Campbell with a knee injury. That was a knee injury to the opposite knee that he had surgery on in the offseason, wasn't it? Yeah, so right knee last year, uh, that kind of uh, patella dislocation, kneecap dislocation. This year it's left knee. They had the uh, the ice like at the end of the game medially, so on the inner side of the knee. And they definitely strapped for that kind of medial knee protection. The one thing there, though, is that, once again, your MCL's there, which would be way more, uh, like, ideal than your MPFL, which we've spoken about, I think, with Connolly Lemuelu. Your MPFL attaches your kneecap to the inner side of your knee, I just have a few concerns that potentially he, look, he's dislocated his patella last year. And the interesting thing about the dislocated patella last year is it just came out of nowhere. Like it was was a non-contact 
issue, which to me, when there's a non-contact issue, it tells me that there might be something underlying that is making him more susceptible to that injury happening. So whether it's the anatomical alignment of his knee, does he you know, does he, the groove that his kneecap sits in, is it a bit shallow? So it's easy for that kneecap to pop out. Is the alignment, is that kneecap just already sitting a little bit laterally, a little bit more than normal? And does it need to be sitting a little bit more medially or more towards the inner side for him to avoid that? There's a few just kind of, I guess, biomechanical hereditary genetic things that can contribute to that happening last year. And then now he's got this knee issue again that apparently carried from last week and had to pass a fitness test. So, look, hopefully, hopefully I've just ranted on about that. Hopefully it's just an MCL sprain and nothing more. But, yeah, I just, uh, like, I'm waiting to hear more on this. I haven't listened to the post-match presser uh, with Des. (laughs) Des doesn't usually give much away. Hopefully I'm pleasantly surprised when I get off this uh, podcast and hear that he's detailed you know, the whole injury, but uh, yeah, we'll wait and see on that one. I'm deaf. Oh, look, I'm, I'm a Jaden Campbell drafter in a few, uh, few drafts, actually in one draft. Oh, I have lost. How's this for you, James? I know people love hearing, you know, hard luck. My team is shit stories, but I'm, <laughs> I'm in a keeper league and I had, I went Latrell round one, Tino round two, Sammy Walker round three, uh, Hamaso round four and Jaden Campbell round five, and they are all cooked at the moment. So, my top five draft picks. So, I am just loving life at the moment in that particular league. That is a world of fun, but yeah, look, I think I'm worried that I'm going to be without Jaden Campbell in a couple of draft leagues for multiple weeks at the moment. If it is, you know, what I yeah, what I'm fearing it is. Uh, Zach Hosking with the shoulder dislocation, best case scenario, you're looking at three to six weeks. It looked like a pretty nasty one. Uh, obviously, I think we all would have seen the footage. So, yeah, three to six weeks, best case. If he, he, he kind of dislocated that shoulder, hasn't suffered too much structural damage, they're, they're confident they can strengthen it up. But more than likely, he'll need a shoulder reconstruction at some point. It's just can he delay it till the end of the season before he needs it or is it too cooked and he needs to have it now? So it'll either be three to six weeks or it'll be shoulder surgery now. It could also be three weeks, then he plays for a couple of weeks and then he hurts it again and then needs it. So he's a bit of a risk moving forward. Another one who, yeah, if I own him, even if they come out and said, yeah, we're hoping to have him back in two or three weeks, I'd be moving him on for sure. Yeah, I think with Jaden Kim, we said it in the, like the preseason chat. If you do pick him at six or one, you probably want to have a backup plan. It looks like that's sort of happening right here, right now. So it'd be interesting to see what the Titans do there because AJ Brimson has been moved from center to six today. So whether they... Brimson was you know, so good, James. I know you've probably yeah, been in the thick of it um, You know, tonight. I watched the second half of that game, mate. I mean, I, I should have mentioned too, I wore my, I don't have a Titans jersey, but I've got a crush, a Crushers and a Chargers. So I wore my Chargers just to give the Titans props because they were, they were out. Like they had lost Jaden Campbell, like they were cooked. Mate, if you haven't seen it yet, Brian Kelly's conversion from the sideline to tie it up, his first kick almost went directly sideways. And I was like, and he was stepping up to kick it from the sideline to, to level it up. And I'm like, I give him, just he's a hundred to one to kick it, and he's just absolutely nailed it. But it was AJ Brimson, mate. AJ Brimson, I've, I've, if I die on a hill, it's that AJ Brimson is a is a good fullback, and he just needs to be picked at fullback. He like whether it's for the Titans or whoever, he is a great fullback, and he was phenomenal tonight. So props go to the Titans because they've been in the shit, and I just thought they showed a lot of ticker um, to get back into that game against a really good side in Canberra. Yeah, Canberra have been really, really good in rock solid this year. So hopefully the Titans can get a few more Ws on the board as the weeks go on. Brian, we're going to wrap up the injury sort of summaries there from the games and go straight into the Patreon questions now. So as you mentioned earlier, patreon.com forward slash NRL physio. If you want these questions answered every week, send your hard-earned money there to Brian to his bank account. He'll put it to very, very good use, I'm sure. Question number one, Brian. So what do you think about Nathan Cleary now? If you've held him this long in Supercoach, would you sell him at this point, given it's a bit murky with the hamstring status there? Yeah, so look, at this stage, it sounds like 
there's been multiple reports that Cleary's going to expected to miss round seven. So that would be, he, he will have missed kind of four or it'd be four weeks total. He will have missed um, cause that'll be four, five, six, and then seven. So a four week return to play for a minor hamstring strain is quite rare. Usually you're going to see guys come back in that two to four week range. So he's taken, he's going to take at least a little bit longer than that. And I saw one tweet today. I can't remember who it was from. Uh, said they're going to reassess his hamstring after round seven, which, yeah, I mean, wording's wording, but that doesn't sound fantastic either. Look, he's he's had he's had that history with hamstring issue, obviously, last season, a moderate hamstring strain, which resulted in several weeks on the sideline. Penrith have come out and said there was no setback. I just, I just find that hard to believe. I, like, I would, while he might not have re-injured it i just think if the whole like slower than expected doesn't it's quite rare with hamstrings if there's not an aggravation there like calves are that they can be so fickle they can just be like i just can't get this guy i'm trying to get from 90 to 100 percent sprinting i just can't get this calf to play ball Whereas hamstrings, I certainly find, and and we've seen the results, even if I'm not in an NRL club doing, you know, those rehabs, we see it, they very consistently with hamstrings come back within those two to four weeks for a grade one, four to six weeks for a grade two. It is fairly consistent. The re-injury rate is high, but they consistently come back in those times. So yeah, for him to take longer than that, I would be surprised if there wasn't some sort of aggravation there. That's what I'm kind of basing it on at the moment. How confident am, am I that he's going to be back in round eight? I'm like, I'm going to sit right on the fence and say 50 50 at this point, which I feel like is a bit of a big call because if you had asked me two weeks ago, they were saying they were going to potentially push him big to be back in round five. And now you're telling me I'm saying he, he's 50 50 for round eight. Yeah, it's just not great. So I've said all the bad stuff. James, the good stuff is, is that if you've held him this long, you're potentially only going to be without him for one more week. And then the draw looks really, really good. Like North Queensland, not the strongest. Souths, not the strongest. In terms of defensive, Bulldogs, yeah, they showed some ticker against um, against the Storm, but also a plus matchup. And, and look, Cleary is someone that you're not really caring about match up anyway. But then they've got New Zealand, the Sharks also, you know, leaking some points. And and the big one that I want to talk about, because obviously it's leading into origin. And and usually I would say, and and before when I was doing prep for this, I hadn't looked into it. And I said, oh, I definitely sell Cleary because you're going to be without him for round 13 and round 14. You're going to be without him for round 16 and round 17. So you're going to miss like all these, but round 14 and round 17 for the Panthers is on, is on Sunday afternoon after origin. So you're talking like five day turnarounds. That's huge for him. Now he's coming off a hamstring they're probably going to play it cautious. Look, I think at this stage, if you've held him for this long, I would hold him one more week and see if he's good to play North Queensland. Because I just think the draw between now and Origin and the potential he could back up from Origin is is too enticing for me. But, I mean, we were big advocates back when he first suffered it with how everything was to, to sell him. And we've both gone to SJ. I think if you've done that, I think you, you like I wouldn't, I also me myself, I'm not going to jump straight back on him. Even if he is named for that North Queensland game. Cause I think with this news of an aggravation that leaves me a little bit more worried about his re-injury risk. So I'm more than happy with how well SJ is going. I think if you've sold him, my advice would be to just eyeball him for a week. You've probably got a good alternative in either SJ or Jerome Hughes is who most people went to. And they're both going really, really well. So I think you just roll with them for at least that first week back. But if you've still got Cleary, yeah, I'd be tempted to hold him one more week personally. Where do you sit on that, mate? If I had him, I would hold an extra week. I guess SJ is a logical down option because they've got the Dragons, Gold Coast, and then Newcastle upcoming. So the draw for SJ is pretty good as well. And I guess people would have been holding on to Cleary for that Bulldogs game, which actually doesn't look like a plus matchup 
as much anymore potentially but the dog you know the dogs are a bit of a different breed when it's against the panthers i suppose they're high flying i would still be halfway keen to lean to sj but i think people might have bigger fires to put out than yeah. cleary to sj potentially it's it's probably a luxury trade if you're going to do it now if you're already held in two weeks you've already sort of held through the pain where sj's put up 112 and 95 consecutively i mean that's that's the business there that's why you got to get the good scoop from the sponge brian i reckon you got to get on your advice there from a couple of weeks back just get on sj he's hot as well i think in the team. oh mate oh, you, look i could wax lyrical about how good it is to see like when sj stepped through and scored that try on the weekend james i mean if i was up and about for jermaine asako i was well i was through the roof for sj yeah. doing that that was fantastic but i'll put it this way just to run you through my thought process my thought process before i saw that he had a five-day turnaround after both origin games i was like he's definitely a sell because you're going to miss him for so many games in origin it's just not going to be worth it and there's some really good alternatives like sj has a good draw melbourne also have a good draw we'll, we'll talk about a we yeah, what looks like a stupid trade that i made to bring in someone from melbourne this week because because I feel like Melbourne's got a really good draw as well. Hughes is playing really well. So, like, that's the thing is, even though Cleary is a gun, an all-out gun, your alternatives are actually really strong at the moment. So I don't think you're missing out on a heap by not having him. And so I was like, yep, definitely a sell. But then when I saw that potentially you could have him during that origin period, it just made me a little bit more. And once again, I'm doing a bit of fence sitting tonight, but a bit more on the fence. So that's why I'd kind of hold him for one more week. But if he's out for that Cowboys game, I think that's, I know you've then held him again for an extra week, but it's just getting too close to origin. If it gets that close to origin, he's still dealing with a hamstring issue. I just can't see how they would then make him back up. Uh, after after those, even with a five-day turnaround. Hamstrings are all about loading. We've spoken about that with Tommy Turbo in the past. Tommy Turbo has very rarely backed up from origin with his hamstring issues. So, yeah, I just think, yeah, I, I probably, my definitive, so I don't sit on the fence, I would hold for one more week. But if he's not there for the Cowboys, I'd ship him off. Yeah. Panthers conservative as well with those guys after origin routinely as well, Brian. So in years gone by, they've been far more inclined to rest those guys because of the depth of their squad. They've got that luxury that most other teams don't. They've got guys waiting in the wings who are pretty ready for first grade footy when you look at their results over the last few years. Second question, Brian, is a bit of a nerdy question. It's about true healing timeframe. So the patient question is about, like, obviously players will come back before an injury fully heals, in inverted commas, so such as a one-week return from a low-grade ankle or an MCL. But how long does it actually take for those structures in the body to heal completely? Yeah, this is a question we could do a whole podcast on, James, I think. Like, so a patron's asked this question. I think it's a fantastic question, but it's just not one that has a simple answer in terms of, oh, okay, all minor ligament sprains take this long to fully heal because the ligaments throughout the body have different healing capacities and that's why you see it um you know in different return to plays for different ligament issues so i i guess the thing i would say is I'll, like i'll go back to we talk a lot of the time about return to play versus return to performance often being very different in in so many different scenarios in so many different injuries the, there is no greater example than talking about like how long it takes for things to fully heal. So probably the most obvious ones are things like rib issues, AC joint injuries, like an AC joint sprain at the end of the day is a ligament sprain, right? Guys are coming back with those ligaments nowhere near healed, like nowhere near. And, and a low-grade lateral ankle sprain as well, they've spoken about there. So we, we see guys with high-grade lateral ankle sprains come back within two to three weeks, right? They're not close to being healed, like not, not close, but they're strapped up really well. You know, they've probably got the aid of a few injections to kind of bring that pain down. So how long does it take for those to heal? If you took them out of footy and sort of, you know, because obviously the aggravating factors are re-injuring it in footy, which often happens, it'd probably take at least for those lateral ankle sprains, AC joint issues, rib issues, probably a good six to eight weeks to heal completely. But guys are coming back in 
two to three, right? And and that's six to eight weeks without any aggravation. So if you keep aggravating it over and over again, it can take longer than that six to eight weeks. And that's why we talk about guys playing hurt so often. They're, they're playing hurt because they're playing with ligaments and tendons and things that just aren't completely healed. Probably the one, I mean, we spoke about it with Ty Munro, for example. Uh, you know, you, you're talking about how long does it take bones to fully heal, even though most are coming back somewhere in like a four to eight week range for that callus to form and that really strong, you know, bony formation. You're probably looking at somewhere in the two to six month range, depending on the bone and depending on how much blood supply there is there. And then probably the really interesting one and the one I like to talk about the most with my patients is ACL injury. So you've got an ACL you, you have the ACL graft during the reconstruction surgery. That is a tendon that more often than not a tendon that has to ligamentize or change from a tendon to a ligament. That process takes up to 18 months, but we've still got players coming back at nine months, right? So for to fully heal, once again, in inverted commas, it takes that ACL 18 months at least to heal completely, but that's why we see, you know, the re-injury risk for ACLs is is the well and truly the highest, even in NRL players, in that first 18 months, even return to sport, because 18 months is the minimum healing time. A lot of studies show it can even be longer than that as well. So that first 18 months back, and, and we think obviously that's an acclimatization thing, guys getting back into the sport, getting through returning to that performance, but it's also a healing thing. That ACL isn't completely healed yet and it's not, you know, fully strong. I, I follow a few ACL guys on Twitter and socials and and they advocate for two-year return to plays for pro sports people from um, from ACLs, which just isn't going to happen more than likely. But if you wanted to get the re-injury risk down, that's, uh, that's I reckon, how far you'd go. So have I missed any there that you can think of, James, or any points you want to add? No, all the good ones covered there, Brian. I don't think anything else I'd want to add to the mix there. All good. Cool, mate. All right, let's go, mate. What a week this week. You can have the good bloke stakes this week. I'm more than happy because we both did really well for the first week all season. Mate, hit me with your score and give us the, the – it's an interesting trade week, I think. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting, Brian. You've you've dusted me in both the draft comps, I believe, in the invitation. I, I was going to say that at the end, mate. I wanted to let you have have, right. have I'll, your have I'll, your, I'll, your, I'll have the I'll have the standard pump up, but then I'll I'll admit defeat in in the draft ones. I was looking at the weird scores, that I'm playing you in both bad, on the same but, week. But yeah, anyway, bizarre. Yeah. Hey, anyway, you you dust me and got your horse out and went massive in those two comps. So had to cop those ones. But in standard, so thirteen fifty three was the score as it stands now. So I looped Joey Manu, which obviously helped me enormously. Great to see Sean Johnson going massive again in that team, Brian. That was one of the better trade ins that I've had in recent memory. My trades last week were Schiller and Manu, so pretty obvious there. I think that would have been like ninety nine percent of the Super Coach community. Nothing super exciting there. So this week, lots of options. So I would even throw in a boost. Wouldn't be a bad shout this week, pending what team lists look like next week. My trade-out options are Fatape from center wing, Burbo, obviously, um, Farmasuli from front row, and Joe Chan are probably the four that I really need to look at upgrading or shuffling around. And I guess in terms of the preferences this week, um, Kyle Eero is probably number one, isn't he? He's low, lowly priced, dual position, plays around 13, plays in a red hot Sharks team. He's going to be everyone's first traded in this week, I would assume. Bronson Zeri actually looked good, Brian. I was really surprised with how good Bronson Zeri looked. He's scoring quite well. He's got Adokar outside of him. He's found a pass, which, you know, I guess after four years out of the game, you probably have to develop some skills. So maybe he's developed a pass. So, Good to see by Bronson. And then I guess the other ones would be worthy of consideration, and I wouldn't hold anyone against this, would be Gus Crichton, Sean Bloor, Xavier Wilson, look the business, and also Tamari Martin. Tamari Martin's dual. He's 360, playing in a pretty good team. I know he hasn't been all that relevant in the past, and he has got to reliant on attacking stats game, but he has shown there was a time there where he's playing fullback for the Bronx. He was nearly a must-have, wasn't he? He's had sort of super coach moments and super coach streaks where he's got hot. So I think they're all worth monitoring. There's going to be people that ask about Josh Adokar, whether you bring him in after scoring 160. He's got the Knights and a buy, then Tigers, Panthers, Raiders. So you'd have to take an extra week to make all the cash there, I'd say. So it's a tricky one with Josh because he is probably a maybe for origin. I don't know if he's a certainty. And then they do play round 13. So you sort of want to trade him in and out before round 13, but then you probably want to trade him to another 13 player. 
depends on how much money you can make. It depends on what those numbers look like when um, the break even sort of get calculated next week. While I'm, Brian, I wouldn't begrudge anyone for it if you want to be greedy because I did the same thing with Dom Young. So I have done it myself. So I'm not going to be critical in that space. I think if you want to chase the coin and you've got 160 in your, in your rolling average, probably not such a bad shout there with Josh Adokar there either. I could see an argument for that. How did you go this week, Brian, on the standard front? Obviously, the draft front, you've absolutely hosed me and fair play to you. Mate, I got to go good in some draft comps because yeah, there's a there's a couple there that I'm dealing with a, a Dolphins like uh, injury injury uh, ward and it's just not going well. I think the yeah I, yeah not good not good. So I was very happy to roll you very you know obviously and also very happy with my classic score was which was twelve ninety three this week. So I looped KP with the rumors floating around that Strange would be out. I didn't want to sort of miss out on you know miss out on a player. It ended up cost me i did the math uh, like i was going to captain Hines. otherwise it actually cost me seven points so i'm not it cost me a 1300 point score which you know is neither here nor there but i'm pretty happy with that considering yeah there was all kinds of you know strange would be out rumors floating around uh trades this week i boosted and i got uh joey manu and Schiller as you did but i also got nick meany i tried to big brain it i got on here last week and said Gus Crichton, Gus Crichton, Gus Crichton. Uh, you definitely, uh, you know, your wisdom swayed me a little bit to sort of look at Melbourne. I think Melbourne have really, really good draw coming up, and everyone was jumping on Ellie Katoa. So I just, I just wanted to go a different way. And and Meany had good um, base and power, like pretty good. I think he was floating around like somewhere between thirty and forty average for his um, base and power. So I was like. That plus the goal kicking, like I'm pretty happy with that. But yeah, of course he goes out and scores his lowest, uh, lowest total of the year. Gets dusted by Josh Adokar and Bronson Jerry about a hundred times. So yeah, I don't know. Like I'm still pretty happy with that because I think Melbourne's with that trade. I should say because Melbourne's got a really really good draw coming up, and I just needed a piece of it. So hopefully it pays off for me. But yeah, at the end of the day, I'm just regretting not bringing in Gus Crichton. So my trades are very straightforward. Gus Crichton in, Kale Hero in, Burbo and Bostock probably out. Um, the only other one I've got is Finny Fuiaki, but I can't move him down. I'm I, like, yeah, I've got too many in the center wing. And and then we've also got uh, Chevy, um, the fullback from the Raiders to consider like in a couple of weeks, we'll probably all want to bring him in too. So like, there's just so many cheapies in the CT dub now, which like, where were they when we were starting out? Cause we were picking guys like freaking Drew Hutchison and, and Jamin Salmon. Uh, like, and now we've just got so many cheapies we don't know what to do with it so that's a bit frustrating but uh yeah i think Eero and gus crichton in but i i definitely have in my mind that chevy will probably like i'll probably want him at some point too i'm not sure what he scored um tonight but i'll just quickly get it up um where are we here so so they scored low yeah but so he hasn't surprised no, that's okay yeah yeah and yeah. so you know like attacking stats like a starting fullback if he maintains that starting fullback role as i said the raiders are playing well like i just don't see how that's not a good trade in even with um jordan rapana back in six to eight uh yeah i just i just think that could be a really really good trade in so i've got that in mind mm -hmm. but yeah i think pretty straightforward with me this week i've used three boosts so i probably need to chill out for a little bit i think my rank i'll hopefully be in the i think i had a look there's some hack that you can do on the app and i think i had a look and i could be in around four thousandth, which okay. for, that's yeah, tidy which for I mean, weeks ago I was in about sixty thousand, so I'm on the charge, which is good. So hopefully I can keep that going with uh, with Gus and Eero in next week. Yeah, good shout, mate. I was um, still nursing Tommy Talao in my centre wing, and <laughs> let me just say when I saw the first half when he had a try and a try assist in the first forty, he was on about sixty four, and it went to golden point. I thought, oh, this is the week. The left wing from Manly is getting fed. Anyway, he finished on seventy seven, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a shame, but man, hopefully he can generate just a few little dollars there for me. It's going to be interesting to see if Jason Saab gets back and Ruben Garrick get back next week. It might make him a possible trade out as well because he certainly wasn't scoring fantastically. But I've got to stick to the hype there. You got to stick with your boys. Um, Jess Serge is giving him a few shout outs as well, so I was getting around that. I was like, yeah, good for her, good for me. How good? 
Mate, he's a good looking fella too. So look, he, Rooster. You know, hey, when in, when in doubt, when in doubt, just pick the hot ones. Is you yeah, know, that's definitely my uh, my aim. So yeah, mate. Look, that's a wrap for this week. Always, if you like the pod, give us a view, recommend to a friend, watch us on YouTube. We're growing on there, which is fantastic to see. If you want more info like this, patreon.com slash general physio. But otherwise, James, mate, I appreciate you coming on board. It was a bit of a rough night for you, I know. So I, I appreciate it more than more than most weeks. More uh, other weeks, I'm just like, oh, whatever. I don't really care. But this this week, you did good, mate. So appreciate you coming. And, uh, mate, I tell you what, I'm getting real, real excited for Magic Round, just quietly. I was doing, you know, I think Beck and I were talking about some different things about what's on and i just looked ahead and i'm like oh boy it's not far it's like a month away mate i'm pretty excited yeah look brian i would say the last three or four days has just been tough tough carries in the kurtz house it's just been hit up after hit up after hit up just getting whacked so the point of making it you know magic around on the cards on the agenda it's very very exciting because i'm in the depths of just a real tough time on the tough carries front. I'm I'm just doing my best and just trucking nut, just nice and honest. But I do have that to look forward to. And trust me when I say this, I am very, very much looking forward to Magic Ground. <laughs> We might uh, we might uh, try and do a sneaky and just uh, pull pull a Friday Saturday night over pull the wool over the wives' eyes, mate. We'll see how we go. Hopefully, we'll cross our fingers, hey. Love it, mate. All right, guys, have a good week and up the mighty, mighty Redcliffe Dolphins.